18 nights ago, I had one of the worst nights of my life. I went to bed about 8 o'clock early because George and I were leaving for Guyana the next morning at 4 a.m. And I told you there was an incredible amount of spiritual warfare associated with that trip. It really hit in earnest that night when I laid down to go to bed. And it came in the form of panic, terror, sheer fear. I couldn't tell you why other than I did know that it was irrational and it felt very dark and evil. Now, in the middle of it, I've had these kinds of episodes before and I've recognized they usually happen in association with major spiritual events that were happening and I knew we were supposed to be getting on a plane to go on an important trip to visit some missionaries and do some ministry. But that evening, the panic was overwhelming. I'd never had anything like that before. Fear, fear that I never again was going to experience joy. Fear. I could not get on that airplane and go. It got so bad, I asked Lisa if she would simply read the Psalms aloud to me. And she did for maybe an hour or two. And it helped hold the fear at bay, but it didn't go away. She called one of the elders from our church to have him pray over me. And that elder not only prayed over me, he committed to not go to bed that night, but to pray all night for me. That's the kind of amazing elders we have in this place. She emailed all the rest of the elders, and they too were praying for me. At that point, I told her to go to bed. I thought I would be okay. <clears throat> it was late, maybe around midnight at that point. But when I closed my eyes, the terror returned. I didn't sleep a wink the entire night. As the <clears throat> idea of this trip got closer and closer and 4 a.m. got closer and closer, the panic grew stronger and stronger. Please don't make me go on this trip. I could not for the life of me overcome the fear. In the middle of it, I kept saying, where are you, God? Why aren't you here? Why am I going through this? Aren't you supposed to protect me? What did I do to deserve this? Why won't you show up and rescue me? Have you ever known that kind of fear? Maybe it comes in a debilitating form like the one I had. Maybe it's not as debilitating. Maybe for you it's that gnawing anxiety about the future. Maybe for you it's that stress of watching a loved one go through a very, very difficult situation. Whatever it is, if you're here this morning and you've experienced fear, terror, anxiety, doubt, panic, all of that, I have a word of encouragement for you from the Lord. So if you would take a Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. It's page 968 in the Bibles the church provides. Hebrews chapter 2. We're really this morning going to be focusing on the second half of the chapter. But we don't want to miss the argument that the author is presenting to us in his book. And so I want to kind of walk through the opening paragraphs of the chapter to kind of continue with the story that he's telling us, and then we'll focus on the second half more intently. Chapter 2, verse 1, we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, I've told you that the book of Hebrews is really about two journeys. Jesus' journey and our journey. 
And the first two chapters of the book of Hebrews are really talking to us about Jesus' journey. But the point of telling us Jesus' journey is so that we will follow him in faith, so that our story will be his story. And right at the beginning of chapter 2, the author of Hebrews is warning us, look, Jesus is the path to life. If you ignore that path, if you turn aside from that path, what will happen? How else will you experience the salvation of God, the blessings and the peace of God? We must stick with Jesus. His story, his journey, his path is the right path to go on. Well, in verses 5 through 9, the author of Hebrews not only encourages us to keep with Jesus, he shows us how our story and Jesus' story are intertwined together. Verse 5, it is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, a son of man that you care for him? You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Here the author of Hebrews is telling us the story of Jesus and reminding us that his story and our story are intimately connected together. You may remember this graphic that I put up last week to try to uh, symbolize or visualize Jesus' journey, Jesus' story, and that at the beginning of his journey, he is in the category of God, meaning he is fully equal with God. The exact representation of God's glory. But Jesus did not consider his equality with God something to be held on to. Instead, he became lower than the angels. He became a human. He didn't cease to be God, but he became one of us so that he might come and get us. So that with us, in his exaltation, we would experience glory as well. And what the author of Hebrews is saying is, is that God has now subjected all things in creation to those who are believers in Jesus. Everything in creation is going to be subject to us. But we don't see that yet. Life is still filled with pain. There are still problems. There is still fear. There are still difficulties. We do not yet see all things being made new. But what we do see is Jesus, the pioneer of our faith. For him, he's already been crowned with glory and honor. And the point from last week was, we know that our stories end well because his story has already ended well. And so the author of Hebrews is making this point again. We, our story is Jesus' story. Jesus' story is our story. And while we are still struggling and suffering, he has already been exalted, and we see that, and we know that. Now, last week, the author of Hebrews really started with Jesus' exaltation. He started with the right side of the story, that Jesus has been crowned with glory and honor, and the point is because his story has ended well, our story is going to end well, whatever journey of faith you're on. This week, in chapter 2, the author of Hebrews is going to focus on the left side the descent. There is no exaltation without humiliation. And so in verses 10 through 18, the author of Hebrews talks about Jesus' descent. Verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy, that's Jesus, and those who are made holy, those are believers in Jesus, are of the same family. 
So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Jesus became one of us so that he could make us part of his family, so that we might experience the glory that he now experiences. Verse 14, since the children, that's you and I, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Now I want to stop here for a minute and talk about this. The fear of death. I always took the fear of death to mean the fear of dying. Now it does include the fear of dying, but it is much, much broader than that. What it means is the fear that death produces. And by death, what we have in mind here is separation from God. The fear that separation from God produces. Because of sin, because of disobedience, humans are separated from God. As a result of that separation, there is fear. It might show itself in panic. It might show itself in anxiety or in doubt or in discouragement. But the fear of death, that's what I experienced on that night 18 nights ago. I wasn't as scared of dying. I wasn't afraid of the plane crashing. I was scared of what was going to happen when I got where I was going. I had no idea what the future held. And the panic was the inability to see how this was going to work out. There was somehow this separation from peace and joy. And all night long, that terror, that panic, that was the absence of anything good. It just felt dark. It felt overwhelming. It felt like there was no hope. It felt like I wasn't going to make it out. It was claustrophobic, if you will. It didn't really have anything to do with being afraid of dying. It was the fear of death. Meaning thinking about this journey and this trip separated from the God of all grace. Thinking about this trip and this journey apart from the God who we can trust in his unfailing love. Thinking about what was coming without considering God's power over all things. By thinking about this trip apart from God, I experienced incredible overwhelming fear. The fear of death is what Pastor Tom talked about a couple of weeks ago in his story when he shared his faith journey. For him, it was with the issue of money. He talked about how when he was, God was calling him to become a pastor, he in his mind couldn't work out, couldn't make the numbers work. How in the world can he pay for a house and for kids and for all the stuff going on when he was going to do it on a pastor's salary? And that anxiety and that that's the fear of death because he was thinking about his finances apart from the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, apart from a God who's extravagantly generous, and the result of doing so separated from God is fear. Have you experienced that kind of fear? It may have been debilitating fear like mine. It may, yours may be worse. That fear that comes because you think, I'm never going to get out of this crisis, the fear that you might experience because you'll never know joy again, that you'll never know peace, that this sadness in your heart will never go away, the fear that everything that is coming in the future is going to be worse and not better, the fear about a health situation, the fear about the loss of a loved one, the fear about an assignment that God has given you, whatever it may be, do you know that fear? But this is not gonna turn out well. It's the fear of death. Not necessarily the fear of dying, but the fear that comes from thinking about whatever situation you're going through apart from God. Thinking about whatever crisis you are facing, thinking about whatever's going on in your life, separated from the God of all grace. This is the fear it shows itself up in anxiety or doubt or longing or panic. But Hebrews says this is the fear that Jesus came to save us from. And in order to do that, he had to become human. He had to become like us, why? 
so that he could experience that same fear himself. So that he could experience the fear that comes in being separated from God. The fear that comes through death. And that he tasted death and the fear of death for all of us. That Jesus became human for this purpose. To lead us through fear. Because Jesus' journey did not take him away from fear. Or away from death. But Jesus' journey took him straight through the heart of it. So that he could show us the way through the fear. What I mean is, is in that night that I was having overwhelming panic and terror. Near the end of the night, God took me to the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is that, as the Bible tells us, it's the night in which he's betrayed, he's about to go to the cross, and he's in the garden begging God, please do not make me do this. And in his voice, I heard my own voice begging God, please don't make me get on this plane. Please do not make me go on this trip. Please do not make me do this. And as Jesus is crying out, I realize he's crying out in fear. This is fear about what the future holds. He can't see his way through. Fully human, just like I'm human, experiencing the same kind of fear I was experiencing that night. And amazingly, in Jesus' story, it says in Luke's gospel that an angel appeared somewhere in the middle of his journey to strengthen him. My angel was Lisa and the elder that prayed over me. But the sobering thing for Jesus is after the angel leaves, it gets worse. The angel was just a respite, it was just a break, it was so that he wouldn't lose his sanity. It was this sort of moment of encouragement to help him along the way. But then Luke tells us he was in even greater anguish, even greater anguine, agony, and he cried out more earnestly, crying and praying so fervently that sweat began to pour from him as if he was bleeding, begging God over and over and over again. And that's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. The terror got worse. And it seemed like there is no way out. And then I heard Jesus say to me, in my soul, from that story, the way out, not my will, but yours be done. That Jesus, who can't see what the future is going to hold, he can't understand how he's going to make it through a crucifixion, how he's going to make it through death, how he's going to survive separation from God the Father, chooses to trust God. Chooses to put his faith in God's unfailing love that God will not abandon him to the grave. And then Jesus says, I don't want to go to that cross. I don't want anything to do with the pain that's coming, but not my will, but yours be done. And at four in the morning that night, or the next day, I said, God, I don't want to get on that plane. I do not want to go do this. I would do anything to get out of this. But I'm going to choose to obey. Not my choice, but yours. Not my decision, but yours. Not my will, but yours. And with that, the fear went away. With that, the fear was gone. See, Jesus came to lead us through the fear of death. And he taught me that night the way through the fear is to say, not my will, but yours be done. And I realized no matter what was waiting for me on that plane, no matter what was waiting for me in the country of Guyana, I was going because God told me to go. And that this God who was calling me to go is the God of all grace who can only do good, kind, loving things. And so I determined I couldn't see it, I couldn't feel it, but I simply heard Jesus say to me, not my will but yours be done, say it. And when I finally agreed to it, the fear was gone. I went on the trip and God showed up in powerful, amazing ways and it was a fantastic trip. And I came home and I came to Hebrews 2, verses 16 through 18. For surely it is not 
angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. When it says that Jesus was made perfect through his sufferings, it doesn't mean that somehow he became sinless. He was already sinless. The point is he became qualified for his job. And his job is to be a merciful and faithful high priest. Where was God in the middle of this horrible night? Where was God in the middle of the darkness? He was right there in the person of Jesus saying, I know what you're going through. I've been there. Now, his was much, much worse than mine, but in the middle of that fear, you can't think about anyone else. But when you hear Jesus say, I, I feel for you, I hurt for you, I know what you're experiencing, you realize he was sent to go through something far worse so that when I say, God, I'm afraid, God, I'm scared, Jesus says, I know. I know how it feels. I know that panic. I know that terror. I know that desperation. Please, God, not this. Please, God, not this. Please, God, anything but this. Jesus says, I know. And he says, I've come because I'm going to show you the way out. He's able to save because he's merciful. He's been through it. Human in every possible way. What that means is there is no emotion that you have experienced. There is no thing that you have been through. Now listen, the circumstances might be different. Jesus was not an 80-year-old woman. He didn't experience being an 80-year-old woman. I get that. But whatever experiences you may be having, whatever emotions you are having, whatever fear, whatever doubt, whatever anxiety, whatever discouragement, whatever depression, whatever longings, Jesus has been through it. He is fully human in every possible way. There is no fear that you or I have experienced that he didn't go through first. And he did it so he could show us the way through it. He's able to say because he's merciful, and he's faithful. In the moment of his crisis, in the moment of that absolute terror, in the moment of that fear, in the moment where he begged God, please, not the cross, he was faithful because he said, but not my will, but yours be done. And he's able to save us to show us that's the way through. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever journey of faith you're on, whatever situation you're in, Satan is going to whisper in your ear. If you just lie about your finances, the fear will go away. If you just engage in sexual immorality outside of marriage, the fear will go away. If you just quit this assignment God gave you, the fear will go away. But I'm telling you, it's a lie. The more we disobey, the further we get from God, the more the fear comes. We try everything in our power to make that fear go away. We try everything in our power to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And we choose to do other things, but the separation from God only increases, which makes the fear increase. It becomes bigger, it becomes stronger, it becomes harder. And Jesus says, that's not the way out. The way out is to simply say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Wherever you are, Jesus is right there with you. Not looking at you judgmentally, but looking at you mercifully. That hopelessness that you feel, that despair, that discouragement, he knows that feeling. And what he's saying to you is, look, the solution is not to run. The solution is to bow and to say, okay, Lord, I never would have chosen this. I wouldn't have chosen to have lost my loved one this way. I wouldn't have chosen this health crisis. I wouldn't have chosen this emotional problem that I'm going through. I wouldn't have chosen this lawsuit that I'm engaged in. I wouldn't have chosen any of these things, but not my will, but yours be done. James says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And Jesus shows us the way you submit to God. You say, okay, Lord, I'm going to obey. I'm going to walk through this situation because you put me on this journey. 
Jesus went through all of it for us so he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, able to help us when the fear of death comes. This brings us to our time of communion. If you're here this morning and you're not yet a believer in Jesus, I want to ask you, do you know about fear? Do you know about fear for the future? Do you know about fear for things in your own life? The temptation is for you to try to solve that problem of fear yourself. That somehow in relationship, somehow in money, somehow in success, you can make that fear go away. Now, I don't know what form the fear takes for you. It might be anxiety. It might be doubt. It might be worry. I don't know what it is. But I'm here to tell you, if you think that money or fortune or love or any of these things is going to make that fear go away, that's a lie from Satan. He wants you to disobey God because the farther you get away from God, the more the fear increases, the more it gets a hold of your life. And he continues to use it to control you. But Jesus became a human so that he might experience the fear you're experiencing so that he can rescue you from it. The way through the fear is by following Jesus and saying to God, not my will, but yours be done. And this morning, if you've not yet ever said to God, not my will, but yours be done. In the biggest possible way, that's accepting his son as the savior. What that basically means is, Jesus, I'm gonna follow your path through the fear. Not my own way, your path. To do that is what it means to become a Christian. If you are a Christian, we're about to partake of communion together. Bread and cup are going to be distributed. As you hold them in your hands, I want you to think about whatever it is in your life that's causing you that fear. And as you hold that bread and that cup, I want you to know that Jesus knows what you're going through. He's experienced the same emotions you've experienced. And that bread, which represents his broken body, and that cup represents his shed blood, is the reminder to us, if we say to God in whatever situation we're in, not my will, but yours be done, that the God of all grace, the God who we can trust in his unfailing love, will never abandon us. Jesus' body was broken, and his blood was shed. So that the situation that you're in right now and the situation that I'm in right now, that he could be a merciful and faithful Lord to take you through it. Dane Bjork, one of our elders, is going to come and pray for our time of communion. When you receive the bread and the cup, hold on to them and then we'll partake of them together. Dane.